technology is behind us rather than ahead of us, um, but it, it does eventually join. Anyway, th thank you all so much, and I uh, uh, apologize. And uh, in, in some secret way, I'm thrilled that Columbia is uh, incompetent in, in, in the media uh, in the moment of, of once again, uh, learning from Ken. This is, this is a very special occasion. Um, uh, arguably, um, I don't know, when the school turned 100 years old in 1981, that might have been the other one. But this might be the biggest occasion in the history of the school uh, since its founding in 1881 with two students who passed. Uh, a school that was asked to think about the question of the city in 1881 when America was 28% urbanized, having been 15% urbanized 40 years before and 50% urbanized 40 years later. So right in the middle of rapid urbanization. So this school is not just a school about the cities, it's a product of cities. And since the world population, world is now 50% urbanized and the population is 500 times the size it was in 1881, the academic responsibilities of this school have grown exponentially uh, with time. And it seems to me, to say the very least, Ken is one of the few figures that can meet that challenge. The school itself, I think, uh, cannot. I think that universities now are needed to think the question of cities and actually the current state of the university is inadequate uh, to the way cities are uh, evolving and the real laboratories for the future lie outside uh, of New York and this gives New York still now even more powerfully than ever the reflective capacity and I think it's in that spirit that there could not be a greater honor than to sit and listen to Ken. Uh, the reason this event is uh, special is because it's a conference curated by Kenneth. There are rumors that he's having a birthday next week. Uh, there are rumors that he's about to turn 80. These are just urban myths. Um, urban myths, as you know, are like bulletproof. Um, look at the guy. No way he's turning 80. No way. Uh, anyway, uh, he moves too fast to celebrate uh, just one more decade. Um, as a card-carrying workaholic, there's always work to be done. Uh, Kenneth is always resharpening his focus and moving forward. He's exactly that, a historian on the move. This is a conference to celebrate and learn from Ken's latest thinking. This is not a celebration of the glories of the past, but actually the kind of challenge of the future. Uh, it's a chance for us to maybe guess at what he's going to work on next, because you know him, right? That's why you're here, and you know all of his tricks. And I'll point some of them out to you so that it will make it more difficult for them to, him to use them on you. But he's going to use them on you, and you'll have no defense. There's no vaccine against Frampton. Here's how he's going to do it. Firstly, he's going to apologize. I mean, the first, second, third, or fourth sentence, but usually all four. <laughs> he's going to tell you he's completely dis disorganized and that he's brought the wrong slides or that he's brought slides and we're supposed to be in PowerPoint. He'll apologize to you for being so inadequate. And then you're done in because now you're softened. Uh, you don't know whether to be super annoyed that the guy didn't prepare himself for you, especially, especially since you arrived on time uh, today. Um, and you may be just annoyed that he didn't bother to get himself together, or you might even feel sorry that he's been so overwhelmed <laughs> by, by you. But of course, in the end, what's really worse is that you feel guilty, um, uh, totally guilty, for having, as it were, forced him to turn up and perform uh, for you to leave his, to, for having, you feel guilty for having, as it were, lured him away from his writing desk, from his friends and from his family. But at this point, of course, you just start to feel so soft and warm that he will then slowly and steadily change your mind if you, or give you one if you didn't have one when you walked in, um, which is, as you know, quite the norm. Uh, and, and I could, by pan, Pope Francis indicate that actually the less mind you have, the higher you may rise, actually. So to the extent that you listen to Ken, you will be repositioned within the marketplace. You won't rise so quick, but boy, uh, will you have something to offer. Anyway, he's just softly showing you some stuff, and the thinking and the examples will become more and more decisive. Um, be warned, slowly, you won't even notice it. it all, everything suddenly becomes very clear, and there are no apologies at all. And he might be criticizing you in the middle of that. It all sounds like entirely uh, reasonable. And then he starts making points. I mean, points will be made. Um, 
who else makes points today? I mean, I just I think about that. Can you name any other writer in architecture who makes points? Now, your children will tell you, well, yeah, making points would be a pretty reasonable thing for an academic to do. I think there's only one person who makes points. I mean, actually numbers them, right? Um, who has a point would be the next thing to say, right? Not so many. And then at the very end, just when these points are coming in, one, two, three, four, five, six, I think, sometimes there has been eight. So I don't know if it's climbed above eight. Has it got to eight? Maybe today is eight. Uh, at that very end, and be careful of this, and this is the point at which you have least resistance, he will snatch defeat from the jaws of victory in the last four sentences again. The four sentences keep, keep a warning sign for He'll apologize again for having failed to fully prepare again, and he will criticize himself, pointing to some obvious gaps in his presentation. Uh, you don't believe it, of course. Right? You absolutely don't believe these thoughts. In fact, the more he discredits himself at the end, the more dignity is given to the points, and of course, that's his point. So you walk away with, so you walk away with the points, right? Um, which, of course, are the same ones you heard last time, but layered and evolving. Right? They've changed. And why have they changed? Because actually he was quite serious about those gaps in the logic, genuinely modest about them, and generally worried that the argument is fragile. So he then works on those gaps. I mean, he's very serious about being uncertain, which is what scholars are supposed to be. It's what universities are for, to, as it were, house uncertainty so that that can be transformed into hypotheses which could be taken uh, to the world. Nothing is more boring than a teacher that knows what they're talking about or thinks they know what they're talking about. Anyway, uh, those gaps turn into seminars, lectures, essays, and then books, and so the self-deprecation gives way to un the unabashed beauty and clarity of the thinking. That special experience of listening to Ken, that privilege to listen to him think, becomes a massive communication, it becomes a media event, and he's a media phenomenon. Since 1972, this room has been at the center, well, when it got restored and renovated and so on, has been the key. This room, I would venture to suggest, although this will be uncomfortable to Ken, perhaps is a part of him. I mean, part of his body and certainly part of his brain. So I made a few notes this morning just to try to clarify then. And now the introduction to Ken begins. <laughs> this is, um, I just wanted to say a little bit what I think it means to listen to Ken in this room. And that, of course, that's why you turned up in the morning. No way you'd miss this one, right? Uh, and it's absurd. Uh, how, do you, how do you possibly capture the special qualities of Ken's voice? If I could, it wouldn't, wouldn't be that special and you and I wouldn't be here. And also, it's a voice that's continuously evolving and that's the point of the conference today, to hear what's the next step in that evolution. Perhaps I would venture to suggest a voice is only a voice if it evolves. Why else would you bother to listen? Uh, Ken is just simply somebody you want to listen to, one of the very, very few. He's our teacher, whether in the classroom or not. Or rather, he turns the whole world into a classroom. Right here, one of the things he does is turn the world into a classroom. For a moment, this room seems to be the real world, and the rest, the outside, seems to be the classroom. And he patiently and relentlessly shows us how buildings in all corners of the planet speak about what our, the highest aspirations of our society could or should be. The class never ends. The thoughtfulness never ends. We all happily stay in class, especially, speaking for myself, and others, if we disagree with this or that or that and that and that and that, right? Because what else do you want to do but listen to somebody to which you are almost agreeing with but not quite, and then the conversation begins? Because we are architects, of course, and there is one thing we never disagree about, and that is that there is something there in architecture around which we cluster. And this something is what Ken shares with his students, and it's the thing that turns the students into colleagues and the colleagues into students. Ken is an architect. He speaks as an architect to fellow architects. He very rarely strays outside this collegial relationship. And I just want to note that he may be the most widely read and widely influential voice in our field, but he's probably the most narrowly focused to that field. He almost never leaves the work and thoughts of his fellow architects. That's why he speaks so affectionate, affectionately and so tenderly about buildings. The point, I think, and I, I, I'm probably wrong, but I think the I hope I'm not. The point is that it's never the particular building or the particular architect that really matters, no matter how honored they may feel by his words. He expresses his affection, his tenderness towards architecture itself. Actually, he's not in love with whoever he's talking about, but architecture, right? Um, those sort of sensual and intellectual qualities, and I would say especially responsibilities, and that's also a unique to Ken, that architects always circle around, actually, for, for centuries. 
I want to insist on this tenderness, this love of architecture and its unique, resonating, yet ever so fragile capacity uh, to express the highest cultural ambition, and hence Ken's palpable disappointment or even sadness, and I think it's more sadness than anything else, when architects don't live up to this potential, especially when buildings fail to separate themselves from the marketplace, the routines, I would say, of the marketplace, and thereby fail to help us see our world differently. Anyway, I would like to celebrate Ken's tenderness, or to say it another way, but actually exactly the same thing, to celebrate his intelligence. Because what use would intelligence be if it didn't help us to tender ourselves and to be tender towards our colleagues, our fellow citizens on the whole planet, and I would say even if you think about Ken's most recent thinking about ecology, the whole planet itself. Since tenderness is so rarely celebrated in universities, there are no academic awards for tenderness, um, even if, if it might be the real goal of all thinking. Universities like Anglo-Saxons, and here Ken and I can present ourselves as experts, are not good with emotions, uh, or we're very good and not being good with emotions. Let me be then a little bit more academic. If you think of the teaching of modern architecture, the most influential and persuasive manifestation of our discipline during the last hundred years, let's say modern architecture, there are only, in my opinion, three textbooks. That is to say, three books whose relationship to the field is to, as it were, guide and to keep guiding. There are literally hundreds of books about modern architecture and lots of great candidates to be textbooks of modern architecture, but there are only three, I think, that if you're simply an idiot, if you haven't read them, and I don't think there are any idiots in this room, or at least if there are, the exits are clearly marked. Um, these are books that you read and reread every few, few years, something like a flu shot, to act against the waves of stupidity that keep rolling in uh, in our field. Number one, Space, Time and Architecture by Gideon, 1941. Number two, Theories and Design in the Second Machine Age, Rainer Banham, Peter Rainer Banham, 1960. Modern Architecture, Critical History, Kenneth Frampton, 1980. You, you'll notice this 20-year rhythm. Uh, the flu shots keep working, by the way. Gideon still works. Um, but, you, but even the flu shot, you need to add, let's say, from new strains. This story takes us from Prague, where Gideon was born, to Woking, where Ken was born, and that's quite a jump. Um, it's definitely a movement towards the Anglo-Saxon, and quite specifically, you can follow these books moving their way from Prague to London as Germanic art history escapes the horrors, the pre-horrors and the actual horrors of the Second World War, and makes its way to New York. Take the first book, written by one of Wolfland's best students, a product of the high Germanic tradition of art history, who defected, the man who defected from art history to write reviews of architecture in art magazines, then architecture magazines, and then became the very, very active secretary of CM, the policeman of the Union of Architects, literally the policeman, who's in and who's out, who flies and who doesn't. The man with the zzz, checking out whether you're modern or not. The one that writes the official history of modern architecture from within the very engine room of that movement. The second book, the PhD of one of Nicholas Pevsner's, but not just Pevsner, it was also Gideon and Blunt. Pevsner was the father figure to be assassinated, as all fathers are, but Blunt and, and Gideon were there, and of course the Courtauld was the very house of Germanic art history. Uh, he, he then is an apprentice fitter working on engine parts who gets trained at the court hall so he can combine a kind of gritty technical and working class feel with the kind of quasi-aristocratic class of the roots of art history. Um, he presents the first academic account of modern architecture, modern architecture with footnotes. Basically, footnotes get attached to modern architecture in 1960. It's a truly beautiful analysis and a great read, uh, but it's not written by an architect. I think that's very important to understand. The third one is written by an architect, and that's all you need to know. It's not about archives. Actually, the sources are always sec <coughs> secondary or even tertiary and so on. What's primary for Ken is the voice of one architect to another, thinking, thinking, thinking about what architecture is trying to be, thinking in the end about responsibility, but sharing a lot with Gideon, actually, uh, especially in the sense of being in the engine room, the sense that history is in the cause of the present. Ban Banham, too, of course, as you know, but, but there's a, a deeper affinity, I think, with Gideon, and hence the need to keep updating with new editions like Gideon to kind of, as it were, keep the vaccine uh, 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 working, to keep the past, as it were, alive and kicking, kicking us to do better. Anyway, I've gone on too long, but I don't think you can go on long enough for Ken. What I'm trying to say is the obvious. Ken's gift to our field was simply to bring the voice of the architect to the young discipline of architectural history. It's still ex extremely young. 
And the, in bringing that voice to bring our hope, that is to say the architect's hope, which is a very fragile, I think beautiful one, naive relative to the marketplace, but endlessly for that reason beautiful. Or another way to think about it, I think Ken has acted for a very long time as a, as a protector of that hope. He's just kind of stayed uh, near it while the rest of us uh, misbehaved, and misbehave I do. Um, and um, Ken, this is your room that I welcome you back to. That's a hard act to follow. Uh, uh, anyway, thank you very much. It's, thank you all for coming. I have some other thank yous, which, uh, well, first of all, I have uh, once again to thank Mark Wigley and also Ben Prosky, who is in charge of public programs here, because they came to me and said, well, more or less, uh, as it were, that this house would like to do something on the occasion of your 80th birthday, so what, it, what is it? You should say what you would like. And, and I, uh, I sense that that is a kind of, uh, you know, I mean, sort of floating somehow vaguely is the idea that a number of uh, scholars, whatever, would come and speak, as it were, give papers within this kind of academic tradition, uh, which would sort of, as it were, be the, um, the, the necessary uh, prologue to actually producing a published fest festrift, I think they are called. And, uh, or were called, or probably still are called, but uh, so, uh, but I felt I didn't want to do that. Maybe also I felt that uh, I might be made uncomfortable by some of these uh, uh, scholarly contributions, so I thought I would try to dodge that. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a kind of anti fest shrift in as much as it's no, there's no shrift involved except the words of, well, my own words and Mark's words, but also the works, words of the, of the five uh, firms that are collected here to, to make this presentation. And uh, I suppose that might even make a book. I'm, I'm sure it's worth, it, it should be. I, I, I'm so confident about all five of these practices that I, I, I'm sure it merits a book, and particularly perhaps a book that's under one cover, if one's still putting books into covers, that is, and so on. And, and uh, I mean, I think the other point that, that um, Mark made before I, there are one or two other thank yous I want to make before I really start, but I won't make this too long because we're already, uh, as you know, behind schedule. But the, the, the other point that Mark uh, made, perhaps not so directly, is the fact that, uh, you know, basically whatever else I might be, I am architect Molke, you know, that is for sure, I think. And, uh, and though it's very corny, I think it does, I still believe that those that can do and those that can't teach. I think it is, that's how it is, you know. Uh, I, I was trained to be an architect, but I decided at some point, I painted myself into a corner. Actually, when I was a kid, you know, I, I and I, so that was the destiny already there. I, before I could write, I filled, filled, you know, books full of fake writing. So clearly it was a pathology from the beginning, you know. <laughs> I mean, I also drew, but the, you know, the, the writing, you know, there's something a bit weird about that. Anyway, <laughs> the writing was on the wall, so to speak, you know, even if it wasn't writing. And, but it would, anyway, it become a little more, little more intelligible. And um, so there is all this, uh, actually Mark was telling me, uh, you know, about William Ware, and he knows a lot more about William Ware than I, than I do. Uh, uh, it's one of the kinds of mystiques of this place that I am the Ware Professor of Architecture and there has been one more before me, another invention from Aldo Jurgler, and I don't know what will follow me, but uh, one thing I do remember is that William MacDonald, who's no longer a member of this faculty, liked to say, where is the professor? You know, I mean, he <laughs> likes it that. And uh, sometimes with justice. And uh, so I still haven't quite arrived at the written substance of this thing. The other point I would like to make is that although this is really uh, uh, five presentations of five very vital uh, architectural practices, I mean, uh, of course, these practices are implicitly th theoretical. And, and I think, you know, at times also 
uh, architects will make it clear what is the discourse that lies behind the, the realized work. And so I, and, and with that I want to thank these five uh, because they, they, they responded without hesitation and, uh, um, and uh, you know, and, and, and some, I mean, they've come from great distances, from Tucson, from, well, any distance, Toronto, uh, 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 Vancouver, uh, San Francisco. I mean, it, it represents for very busy practicing architects a real effort to do that and uh, to squander a weekend also in, the, in this house. Anyway, they are here and I'm very grateful to them for that. And uh, then I, I do briefly want to thank uh, uh, um, Thomas McKeoch who actually made this, these um, uh, five, uh, put together, well, the, 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 the textual material that accompanies the five flat screen presentations, one of course for each practice, the, the presentations themselves being put together by the firm, of course. And so this is my spiel that I actually, you know, for once, did prepare. Uh, 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 okay, anyway. <laughs> when I was asked by Mark Wigley, the dean of the school, to determine the nature of a public event to be staged on the occasion of my 80th birthday, which is sort of becoming, normally I think one celebrates the birthday on one day and that's it, goodbye. But no, this is a sort of protracted affair. It's rather ominous, I think, but in any case, uh, uh, I opted for inviting five distinguished architectural practices to present their work in succession as the basis for a collective reflection on the status of American culture, of, of architectural culture in North America. As should be evident from the work of these five practices and their respective partners, who graciously accepted to participate in this somewhat unusual, not to say eccentric exercise, I deliberately construed the term North America to include Canada as well as the United States, uh, since my ostensible role as a so-called curator, another strange term for me, I wish to draw attention to the exceptional quality of contemporary architecture in Canada, which in my view over the years, New York opinion still manages most of the time to ignore. So the mixture here of Canadian and American is you know, a sort of little tiny absurd polemic all anthologies are in some sense invidious and a preposterous anthology such as this comprising only five examples or five practices is bound to be even more invidious than most and I have here to beg at once for the indulgence of all those distinguished American architects whose work will not be re represented during the course of this event. By way of making some kind of amends, I can only hope that this selection might be read in the future by some potential publisher as a sample of a much larger anthology which would afford a quite different critical take on contemporary North American architectural production than that to which we are exposed by the modish media of our time. This of course is a little cranky, right? You know, I'm, Mark says, you know, I have this kind of very ambivalent relation to the media and I am sort of inextricably mixed up with it. Uh, I, I, what I'm getting at in a way, way is, you know, that I think what is basically a kind of uh, uh, relatively acritical media, you know, media that won't take the responsibility of making choices and, and choosing to support this and not to support that, you know, and, and sticking the, their necks out. I mean, I think most, with one exception, there is one uh, amazing editor in this re room, Luis Fernandez Galeano, who I think in a certain way does stick his neck out and, and, and produces, I think, the best architectural magazine of record anywhere, still. Apart from my idiosyncratic preoccupation with Canadian work, I wanted um, this somewhat biased anthology, despite its curtailed scope, to focus on three particular points in the trajectory of architectural creation as this unfolds today within the boundaries of the United States that is to say, two representatives, one uh, each from the West and East Coast, uh, Stanley Seidovitz from San Francisco and Stephen Hull from New York, while the third intermediate point, and now I'm just talking about American architecture as opposed to Canadian, on the symbolic triangle would be carried by Rick Joy from Tucson in the Southwest, who never ceases to remind me, I'm not from Tucson, I was born in Maine. But anyway, <laughs> he, he does actually live and work in Tucson and that's, uh, and, uh, but of course builds, perhaps 
to an extraordinary degree in, uh, over m many different regions of North America and elsewhere. However schematic, not to say arbitrary nature of this section selection uh, is, it was not solely determined by geographical location despite my bias towards the North. Instead, I would like to think of that for all the prejudices of taste, my selection of these architects was determined in the last analysis by certain characteristics, values, and preoccupations that may be found to an equal degree in all of them. At the risk of resorting to banal criteria, I would like to suggest that despite creating fundamentally different work, all five of these late modern practices manifest a common concern for the following five expressive factors which may be characterized as, for me anyway, landscape, volume, or if you like the more hackneyed word, space, craft, material, and light. While we may commonly assume that these expressive factors are invariably present in all works of architecture, I would like to put it to you that today this is far from being the case. For not uncommonly we encounter spectacular works that display little concern for the context and the topography in which they are situated, or just as frequently we are confronted with buildings in which everything is given over to the tactile aesthetics of the material surface rather than to any significant articulation of the space within. No names, as they say, no pack drill, but you can fill in the spaces. Instead, all of these practices are committed, these practices, these five practices, in nuanced ways to situating and integrating the work in hand into a specific context and landscape. And while they are all equally preoccupied with material expressivity, they do not pursue this concern at the expense of not according sufficient attention to the rhythmic articulation of space. Finally, there are the diverse, somewhat disconnected attributes of the manifestation of craft and the iteration of light, which every one of these practices displays to varying degrees without in any way being reduced to mimicry, I mean mimicry of each other. By craft, I mean, first and foremost, the craft of architecture itself as a practice, that which Hermann Hertzberger once characterized in my presence, and I love this phrase, the skill of an architect, as though in the last analysis, it is still a trade, one, a trade one has to master if we're going to imagine and synthesize in detail a complex and articulate work with total assurance and conviction. Inseparable from this overarching concept of tectonic craft lies the cultivation of craft in terms of manual technique, which however augmented and transformed by modern technology, still prevails in my view as a non plus ultra of quality production in the field of architecture. This brings me to the most elusive attribute of all, namely the fluctuating iridescent quality of light, which, are modu which is modulated by a structure over time a spectrum of luminosity which not only varies from one practice to another, but also from one building to the next. It is perhaps the most imponderable and unpredictable phenomena, and as such may be seen as the subtle, ineffable consequence of all the other attributes, I mean space, volume, craft, etc. There remains in the work of each of these practices other, one other crucial characteristic that I have so far failed to mention, namely and I don't know what else to call it, but I've called it here, their capacity for typological invention, whereby the building becomes the programmatic catalyst for the realization of conditions and metaphoric significations not entirely foreseen either by the client or the architect prior to the occupation of the work. What I have in mind can perhaps be only clarified by citing certain works for the way in which both program and form come together as to transcend their separate genesis and intent as in the large overhanging roof, say, of the Glen Eagles Community Center in West Vancouver by Pat Gow Architects, which goes beyond its passive climatological function to symbolize the status of the society, of the community. That, that kind of thing is what I'm after. Or let's say Hull's building for Iowa University housing the schools of art and art history, wherein a particular spatial juxtaposition evokes the interdisciplinary nature of the institution it houses, while at the same time 
activating the landscape over which it is suspended. It could well be argued that all of this is too aesthetically determined, or that it is my old preoccupation with critical regionalism masquerading under another guise, or that the pressing dystopic ruptures confronting society are not being adequately addressed by works of this genre despite their not too infrequent public character. To this objection, I would like to argue that architecture has its intrinsic limits and that while I do not subscribe to its hypothetical autonomy, since it is the one cultural form that is inextricably mixed with the life world and dependent on material, material circumstances, I would nonetheless insist that at the same time it cannot be expected to answer for the dysfunctional, self-destructive convolutions perpetuated by global corporate capitalism in its decline. I'm reminded, uh, having said that, of this wonderful aphorism of Aro Ziza, which is, I tell them, actually Mark also put, reminded me of this, I tell them, university authorities, that architects are specialists in non-specialization, but they cannot take that, not even as a joke. Uh, I believe that today promises to be a rather rich and uh, intense event in which the presentation of the five practices with a break for lunch, short break for lunch, will follow in a rather dense succession to culminate at the end of the day in a relatively brief but hopefully fruitful panel discussion between the protagonist and the audience and myself, I suppose, before entering into the festivities of a reception. The order of the presentations will be Stanley Seidovitz, uh, of Seidovitz, uh, not, not Toma Architects, San Francisco, Shim Sutcliffe Architects uh, of Toronto, Rick Joy Architects, Tucson, Patco Architects uh, from Vancouver, and Stephen Hall from New York, our own Stephen Hall, of course, who teaches here. We have decided to accept two or three questions from the audience from after each presentation in order to maintain a certain vivacity. The procedure will be to gather these three questions, hopefully it will work out, and, and then ask the speaker just to cover all three at once, basically. I've only, uh, I just want to add a kind of rider, which is that, which came out of experience, uh, uh, which came out of seeing these five screens this morning. Because I, you know, I, 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 I obviously was aware of a certain uh, um, familial connection between these five practices, but I had not expected the the juxtaposition of these five screens with the, with the continuous uh, rotation of images in each screen to, to, be, to present such a, an incredible rich body of work, I, I had not expected that. Uh, that. That just blew me away, really. And, and uh, um, I mean, sometimes you, you if, the, if the names weren't there, you would be sort of slightly uncertain at times who had done what, you know, as well. But, but I have to admit that. But I, I think it is incredible. It is very encouraging. I think it's it's amazing, rich body of work. I hope you enjoyed the proceeding. Thank you. So I, I have the honor to prevent Stanley Seidovitz. I want to begin with thanks. Firstly, for being here for this milestone in the life of a person I so greatly admire. And secondly, to Ken for the many years of being a radar, helping steer architecture. So many times since I left school and began working, the values and measures you've provided have directed my efforts and helped me continue on an architectural agenda and weather the tangents and fads that have emerged. Your voice, and the work you've upheld has been a continuous conscience and source of aspiration and inspiration. It's hard to imagine what architecture or my own work would be today 
without the concepts you have crystallized over the years. The first piece I remember was the article in Perspective 12, which presented Maison de Verre as a building in time rather than an object, and totally changed how I thought about architecture. Soon after, Alison and Peter Smithson visited our school in Johannesburg and showed their English modernism and mentioned the idea of a felt parallel. That set me on a path that I later transplanted in San Francisco, but was only able to name after the writings on critical regionalism appeared. This continues to be the direction of my work. Both schools I attended stopped teaching history before the last chapter of Bannister Fletcher, and it wasn't until modern architecture a critical history that there was a comprehensive account of the work that interested me most. That book was on every reading list that I ever made at UC Berkeley. Studies in tectonic culture was the final nail in the coffin of postmodernism. Each of these, to name only the most obvious, are pivotal to my work. So to thank you for this is to vastly understate the huge gift you have given. I'm going to speak about practice. The word practice is derived from the Greek pragma, meaning action. The theory which drives our practice is pragmatism from the same root. Pragmatism originated in the United States in the 1870s and was always represented and has always represented a distinctly American way of thinking. Pragmatists argue that the function of philosophy should be to find out what definite difference it makes to our lives. Beliefs are rules for action and to develop a thought's meaning we need to determine what it produces. Pragmatism does not have rigid canons or obstructive dogmas. It unstiffens theories and is genial and entertains any hypothesis that has practical consequences. For each project, we develop a set of principles derived from the particular situation and specific site to drive the process. And I'm going to show three. This is Yerba Buena Lofts. The first thing I ever knew about San Francisco was from songs long before I moved there. Working in a city of songs and being part of building this city has been my focus. I've constantly searched to understand its nature, something I think Ambrose Bierce captured when he wrote, this city is a point upon a map of fog. There are 179,000 building parcels in San Francisco. 173,000, or 87.8%, are residential. Housing is by far the most important constituent element of the fabric of the city. So naturally, this has been central to our work. The first Victorian infill was our office loft, built in 1991, followed by a number of other buildings in which we developed prototypes and an approach to urban housing. 15 years later, we built the building next door, and later, this one a couple of blocks away. Then we had the opportunity to build a whole streetscape with Yerba Buena lofts. I've always been interested in continuity in buildings that are more than themselves. The subdivision and redivision of land, the grids within grids to the scale of individual units and eventually furniture, is the ordering device of the city. At Yerba Buena Lofts, this urban logic is extruded vertically to become the structure of the building. Each loft is thought of as a stacked loft. The building is a rigorous and repetitive subdivision of plots. Our urban housing emerges from highly modulated and systematic plans. We use the lessons of mass production, and although there are claims that current technolog technologies will bypass the need for repetition, we have used the economies of serialization to increase quality. We've never had an interest in arbitrary variety, preferring to make all units the same and good. And when inhabited, the neutral spaces we provide result in much more difference than I could ever imagine. I've always wondered 
how architecture could be a tool of liberation. Very early, I began to confront the question of indeterminacy versus programming, smooth versus striated space. The first building I built outside Johannesburg in 1976 was an artist's loft. It was conceived as a scaffold, a frame in which to make a painting. It followed two precedents, Maison de Verre and the Eames House. I thought of it as an instrument rather than an object, more like a telephone than a conversation, more like a camera than a photograph. I was so intent on destroying program that I refused to have a bathroom. A toilet floated behind a corner on one level, a tab, a tab sat on another, a shower on the other. The dining room was a mobile cart which rolled around the house and out into the garden through the hangar doors. In our current housing, in order to provide indeterminate deprogrammed space, kitchens and bathrooms are accumulated, collapsed and minimized. These servant programs are compressed into thickened walls, eliminating the whole idea of rooms and replacing them with minimally differentiated <coughs> continuous fields. The plans consist of thickened walls and space. The service walls double as structure and align vertically stacking plumbing. All electrical and sprinkler runs chase through these zones, producing added economies. All lighting emanates from these dense walls. This process of reduction, compression, and repetition provides opportunities for expansion and the reallocation of resources to increase qualities in other areas. Through hierarchical unities, elements are assembled, grouped, and minimized, providing the maximum amount of free space for the occupants to determine their own program. In the case study houses of the 50s, a new modern dwelling emerged in California. Spacious, open and free, it redefined the domestic landscape as a fluid, continuous field. This house fully embraced the mechanisms and appliances of modern life, placing them within the same, with the same ease as furniture. This is the dwelling model we've used for the design of our multifamily housing. Density and intensity have their own de demands and the projects we do are the result. This is the um, main, whoops. Um, the front of the Yerba Buena Loft. Um, on the lowest level is um, live workspace, which is a kind of regulated artist activity. And then basically the um, stacked units above with the recesses, which are code requirements, which actually um, are established to prevent large buildings from being built in San Francisco. Um, there's also the sort of sense here of the building as a continuous extrusion of the sort of structure and fabric um, of the city. The building um, bridges between two zones of the city. Um, this is a 40 foot high zone and the building steps down to meet this zone. And here you see the texture of um, the fabric of this part of the city which is replicated in the building. Um, this is um, the ground floor plan showing the artist um, activity commercial lofts at the ground level, um, the main lobby entry and the entry to the parking which is buried um, within uh, the uh, center of the building and then another set of lofts with garden units which uh, connect onto the alleyway and a second smaller uh, lobby entry. And um, a more typical floor where you see the parking now um, contained within um, this uh, donut of units and um, the, the sort of ability to actually drive in and park um, at your kitchen, which is kind of what I realized was very marketable and part of the American dream that you could drive into your kitchen. And um, here you see the sort of uh, setup of the building with um, the parking at the center, the um, larger scale, and this um, street wall, which is comprised of bays and balconies, which articulate the edge as it meets the city. And then the podium, which um, connects to the 40 foot height of the zone behind with the same sort of treatment along its edges. And the um, sort of tower 
part of the building where it steps back and other unit types are established. This is um, the kind of typical articulation of that edge with these carved out balconies where the, ed the outer edge is channel glass on the street and then tear glass which carves a, a sort of private court into the face. Um, a view on um, the boulevard side on, on Folsom Street um, with the larger scale and then the view stepping down to the garden units which connect to the alleyway on the smaller scale of the city. And um, this cascading uh, of scale down to the alley and the garden units and uh, another view of um, that street wall. And this is a slide that's always interested me because this building was actually built after this building. So it's a sort of um, counter uh, contextualism where the horizontal channel glass is here replicated as clapboard siding and the, the sort of rhythm of structure becomes um, a series of bays. So it's, it sort of um, shows that contextualism works both ways. This is the organizational structure of these vertical um, lots with um, a 16 by 16 space um, in which the bay and the balcony and a house are created. And the variation of this in a fairly random way to produce a, a, a sort of urban texture and richness. And the view of these lanterns um, of uh, channel glass and the balconies at night. And again, this um, sort of street structure of the variety that's created within this very simple um, system. And the images that start to emerge, which are reminiscent of some of the uh, moments of the Victorian city of towers on corners and the um, building on the boulevard at night. The key to this building being able to be delivered in the marketplace at a competitive price was actually in the system that w was used to construct it, which is highly repetitive. Um, these um, wallums, which are basically the same form that's used all the way up, um, these sliding forms which are inserted and pulled out. And then the fact that um, the production of the building is also the completion of the building. So after the concrete is cured, the um, glass is inserted and at that point the building is finished and waterproof. Incomparable buildings that are being built um, in San Francisco using similar techniques of construction. Seven trades follow each other to create the seal because the concrete's basically hidden between some kind of skin of um, framing and um, window inserts and um, flashing and, and um, drive it or, or, or some kind of final uh, rain screen. So here two trades actually achieve the completion and the building is actually built from within itself so that it doesn't need any scaffolding because there's so little actual work that needs to be done on the exterior. And these savings actually were translated into using better materials. So typically in the competitive buildings it's impossible to get this much glazing. Whereas here the entire surface of the building is actually uh, constructed of glass. And this is just the process where you see that as the building um, is being um, still poured, uh, the, the finishing of the lower units is possible and work's going on. So the time frame gets compressed, which is a huge economy. And here, with, by the time the roof is being put on, the building's already all sealed up and being completed on the interior. Um, the lobby which is basically all the structural and this building was all structural concrete so that it's pretty raw um, but we did do some tuning up for example the saw cutting in the structural slab and staining to produce a, a kind of finish for the lobby and the interior the second lobby um, the interior streets which are 320 foot long so they were um, thought of as a kind of eight by eight cube, which is articulated at each uh, doorstep with this um, color that sort of uh, announces the front doors. And um, the unit types of which, um, there are actually four <coughs> with four subtypes that um, are created by the requirement to set back parts of the facade. 
and the units as they were delivered, which is basically a raw shell. And in this case, um, as urban housing, it's the sort of cubic dimension rather than the square footage that is a, a measure of the kind of generosity of, of the building. And then there was a, a kind of option center where you could purchase um, your finishes. And um, this resulted in a, an enormous combination of units. There are 200 units in the building. I've been in many of them and they're almost all unrecognizable from the other, even though the bones are so similar through this um, sort of very simple um, technique of just allowing people to choose their, their final finishes. This would be a, 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 a typical kitchen, um, the bathroom loft, and then uh, again the, the sort of finish and a, another unit with a totally different feel because of the finishes chosen there. And here the sort of condition of the um, outer edge of the building with this translucent um, horizontal glazing which creates a sense of privacy and then this carved in clear glass section which creates outdoor space. Every unit has its own private outdoor space and some of the units on the podium setback have these large garden terraces. And again, a view of the building on the boulevard and um, as part of the streetscape of the city. These are some of the offshoots of that building. Here, a multi-use building with offices, townhouses, flats, and a whole variety of, of different types of units. Uh, here, a building on a very steep site where you enter at this upper level which becomes a public space and then go up and down into the units. Here, um, in a very traditional sort of neighborhood on Russian Hill, a reinterpretation of bay windows into um, screen porch outdoor spaces. Here, uh, in the south of Market area near clubs where there's a conflict of use between residents and nightclub and a, a kind of screen building which can shut itself down at night to keep out the noise. Um, at the intersection of Market and Octavia, uh, the, a gateway to the city, this is where the freeway basically ends in the city. And so this is the, uh, the Octavia Gateway building, which is the entry to this new boulevard and the whole northern part of the city. Um, at uh, Market and Page, another mixed-use building. Um, at um, Fulton, uh, right behind the city hall, here a building which takes the traditional crenellated bay window streetscape and turns it into a curtain wall. So here there's only one trade actually which will be involved in the completion of the building. Um, in the mission, in this very vibrant sort of um, cultural area of the city, um, again mixed use, um, in Oakland, um, a tower in Cleveland for Case University. These buildings are under construction now. Um, student housing um, for California College of the Arts and um, a project um, in uh, one of the outer districts of San Francisco as Park Miss said, which is more suburban and um, in this case where each house is given a garden as a, a part of um, their urban kind of uh, life. The next project is the uh, Tampa Museum of Art. Museums began in ancient times as temples dedicated to the muses where the privilege went to be a muse, to witness beauty and to learn. After the Renaissance, museums went public with palatial structures where the idea of the gallery arose a space to di display paintings and sculpture. Later, museums became centers of education. Researching, collecting, and actively provoking thought and the exchange of ideas. By presenting the highest achievements of culture, museums became a stabilizing and regenerative force, crusading for quality and excellence. The role of the modern museum is both aesthetic and didactic, both temple and forum. The design of contemporary museums can be characterized by two polar approaches. On the one hand, buildings which aim to be works of art in themselves, independent sculptural objects. On the opposite end of the spectrum are museums as containers, as beautiful jewel boxes, treasure chests, whose sole purpose is to be filled with art. 
This museum is a neutral frame for the display of art, an empty canvas to be filled with paintings. It is a blank container, a scaffold, infrastructure to be completed by its contents. A glass pedestal supports the jewel box above. The building floats in the park, embracing it with its overhanging shelter and reflective walls. It is a hovering abstraction, gliding above the ground. The site um, brought with it some um, complicated conditions. It's in a floodplain with an 18-foot high water level. So no art program could be located within that floodplain. Um, it's part of a reconstruction of the downtown of Tampa and the famous Kylie Gardens, which have fallen into pretty bad disrepair over here, and the Harry Wolf building, which I'll show you over here. But Tampa is a very suburban sort of city, so this was an attempt really to um, create a cultural center with a new park, a children's museum, and then the Tampa Museum of Art. The program on the ground, which is basically all um, non-art related programs except for delivery and handling begins on the riverside with um, a bookstore and a uh, cafe, a very large kind of multi-purpose space which is the lobby, some meeting rooms and then other kind of support programs. The building is actually very clearly zoned in two buildings. The one, the building that has all the public programs of art and display and the other, all the programs of support, which are extremely um, large compared to the, the, the actual uh, usable gallery, gallery area. Each of, these, um, two, each of these buildings are organized around a court, the court of the galleries, which is a kind of um, pivot that you have a very clear itinerary to um, experience all the gallery spaces, and then the support building around another courtyard in the rear, and um, the, the rest of the support building offices. Um, here you see the sections and the way that the two separate buildings are joined by this gap, and the two courtyards which arrange the programs of the two buildings. And then this massive cantilever which produces shade and creates a, a kind of public porch the first time I went to the site, it was so hot that I actually had to go back to my hotel and wait for the sun to go down. Um, so I, I decided immediately that the one thing that I was going to do was make shade um, out of the building. And then the program actually really facilitated that decision. Um, here you see the structure that supports this massive 40-foot cantilever, which are a series of um, shear cores onto which these girders are um, attached and then the uh, cantilever is hung from. One of the essential natures of museums is collection and collection um, creates um, the need for uh, expansion. Everybody always runs out of storage and so many contemporary museums are fixed objects that don't allow uh, addition. So here it was really important to establish a system which would produce the possibility of growth and so there's a, a, a kind of mat building with uh, a grid of cores which um, es establishes sort of tartan and then a, um, a, a kind of set of building blocks and a, a, an easy uh, ability for the museum to um, sort of perpetuate itself and grow. One of the big problems of the project was that the museum currently has a very minimal um, collection, it's more like a Kunsthalle, so a lot of the shows are actually um, uh, borrowed and very, very um, strict insurance allows uh, no daylight to be uh, uh, available for the, in the gallery. So basically, um, we had this sort of blank uh, object and, and no real architectural context to work out of. So the two elements that um, I chose to think about in terms of how to enrich the quality of the exterior of this container was um, the sky and then also the water. And to make a sort of object without content or image that would have this sort of shimmering, um, changing life uh, like nature. And the way that um, we achieved this is 
through these um, perforated metal panels, which happen to be produced by McNichols, which is a company that um, operates out of Tampa. The, the other thing about this museum was that it had an incredibly modest budget, so we had to really be begging for um, money, and it was finally built for under $400 a square foot, which is much less than some of our custom houses. Um, so basically, the way that we created this effect was through this um, series of uh, perforated panels which were uh, detached six inches and um, slipped to uh, sort of introduce this um, start of a moray pattern. And as you move around the building and walk towards it, it's constantly flickering and um, reconfiguring. So here you see it on the, the box on the pedestal. Um, Oops, let me see, I'm just taking this one off now. Yeah. Um, and anyway, the, the kind of idea of this um, huge public porch which um, absorbs the park and, and reflects the park through these glass walls. And um, the approach from um, the town um, along this pathway underneath the porch um, towards the river, which is where the lobby actually occurs, so that you walk down this very sort of quiet um, sort of space um, and end up right near the water before you enter. This is a sculpture court, which is part of the gallery space up above. And one of the courtyards around the working part of the museum. And the idea of the museum always as a, a frame. Um, here the um, split between the two uh, parts of the museum. the skins here a single layer but on the right hand side uh, the, the, the two layers with the brackets which detach the outer layer a view of that split from the inside and the lobby of the building this is the main entry and the lobby is entirely glass and on the two ends uh, which parallel the river um, it's completely open so that the space runs through and links other uh, cultural institutions like the Performing Arts Center and the University of um, um, Tampa on the other end. Um, this is a view through that um, glass lobby. The stair which goes up to the art program and the court that arranges the gallery spaces. The sculpture court, which overlooks the river. And the galleries, which um, were intended to be as neutral as possible, almost like um, sort of snowstorms. Um, it's white polished concrete and barisol fabric ceiling so that um, to, to eliminate the problem of not having any daylight we try to create a, a kind of day sky with artificial light. And all of the mechanisms are held as high above the ceiling as possible to try to keep the space as neutral as possible. And the slits are um, replicated in these saw cuts in the polished concrete. This is the sort of inhabited um, space of the gallery. And various transformations of this neutral canvas. 
to have the equivalent of the moray patterns um, present themselves at night, we um, arranged a series of LED lights in the gap between the two skins. And um, this presents the sort of image of the uh, building now as the possibility of uh, the museum almost turning itself inside out at night and becoming a big urban canvas. And artists um, have been hired to create um, various kinds of artworks on the surface. Life of the porch at night. So the museum as an urban porch, a jewel box floating on a glass pedestal, hovering in the park a hyphen between ground and sky. The museum is frame. This is Beth Shalom, which is the last project that I want to show. It begins with the problem of Hebraic architecture, which doesn't really have an architectural tradition. When um, these amazing buildings were uh, being built in Egypt, Abraham, who's the founder of the Jewish nation, was um, and had visited Egypt, was living in a tent. So the Jewish tradition sustained itself and survived not through architecture, but through the word and um, through ceremony rather than um, through objects. There's no kind of synagogue tradition that one can really um, base a, a building on. Um, but um, one of the amazing sort of... Um, statements that a rabbi uh, Heschel made was that the, the equivalent of the great cathedrals um, for, for the Jews is, are the Sabbaths, the Sabbaths which mark th on every week through time um, this, um, this nation. And so it's, it's time rather than place uh, that, that um, the Jewish religion has um, perpetuated itself through. But in digging, there are some examples of architecture. The first being the tabernacle, which is described very um, fully um, in, in Exodus um, and was um, spelled out by Moses. And the interesting discussion about the tabernacle is that everything um, is, is in great detail, but it's always about how things are connected, much more than the things themselves. So that the idea is that the tabernacle itself is not important in itself. It's only important in the way that it connects the community around it. And it's, it's, it's that that is its role. Um, the tabernacle was formalized when um, the Jews settled in, in Jerusalem. And the temple is um, the sort of built version of the tabernacle. And this, again, is always described in terms of ceremony and in terms of the relationship of space to use. So these diminishing courts are explained as there where their use was, there where their dimi dimension was greatest, there was their greatest use. Even the act of building was more important as a ceremony. And the way the building itself was built, it's described that the building was built in silence for neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was allowed in the construction of the temple. And here, another example of the idea of a building um, as an instrument. Um, this is a stair to the um, altar. And when the priests climbed this stair of irregular rises and treads, they sang a song, the song of ascent. And through their voices and, and the rhythm of the song, they were uh, cemented to the building. And the last um, piece of this is this, which is kind of the center of um, the Jewish world today, which is a, a wall of this temple with no real aesthetic quality, not very good stonework, but still the most holy and, and, and sort of sacred center that Jews have. Another piece of this history is that after the temple was destroyed, 
the synagogue emerged as the place of prayer. And this is Masada. And on Masada, um, there is this um, remnant of the earliest synagogue that's known. And you can see that it's a very much a space in the round. The ceremony was conducted in the center and a very kind of communal um, and, and focused type of space. Jewish uh, liturgical spaces got affected later by um, the church models and became frontal and um, performance based. But the original way that the worship has always been carried out is um, very centrally and communally. And here you can see the diagram of, of that space. Um, the first synagogue that um, I worked on is in La Jolla where um, we used the traditional European model of synagogue. So it still has this terraced kind of look in the center, but it, it embraces one aspect of synagogue life which is now no longer relevant, which is the separation of men and women. It's not used in that form in this particular synagogue or in any synagogue, many synagogues anymore. But um, basically the original idea was that women didn't participate in the service and sat in these balconies up above and all of the activity occurred with men on the lower level. In the synagogue that I worked on in San Francisco, the synagogue itself was the first um, conservative synagogue to dispense entirely with um, the, the separation of men and women. And it was very important that the building reflected this transformation, which is what um, gave rise to this form. This is the site which is along Park Presidio and Clement. And an early plan established um, two religious buildings um, to be built. There was a synagogue here which was demolished for the new project. Um, initially, the synagogues were, at the, the religious buildings were not subject to uh, normal zoning and they were allowed additional height and so on. But the current zoning doesn't recognize th uh, that right. And so the synagogue had to conform with all of the residential zoning. The only exceptions are for steeples, which um, Jews don't have much use for. So um, it basically had to um, conform in, in the residential envelope. And um, this is the Christian Science Church, which is much earlier, which is much larger structure. Um, here you see the um, site plan. And initially, the building which had occupied the site had built out the entire lot. What I tried to do was um, use the existing rear yard pattern and pull it into this courtyard so that it was um, continuous with the, the neighborhood, which um, I thought was a nice gesture, but the neighbors hated and try to slap um, controls on how we use that space and so on. Um, the, the whole process of um, going to a, re a, a sacred space in the midst of a city was of interest to me and I wanted it to be a kind of transformative journey where you entered into a courtyard, went up some stairs and then arrived at that other courtyard and then went in. So it's a sequence of um, transformations. On the lower level, are all the sort of daily and, and um, support activities, the offices, a meditation room, a library, classrooms, and a, a connection to an existing school building which wasn't part of this project. And then um, this is a, a building where there's a daily chapel where morning and evening services are held every day, more meeting rooms, and a kitchen, which is really two kitchens. Um, this is the continuation of that journey up into this court, which links the three key elements of the program, the sanctuary, the school, and a social hall. And um, another view of that, here you can see the uh, section of the building where you see the sort of elimination of the idea of balcony and this continuation, continual kind of folded space where everyone has a view of the center, which is um, where the Torah is read and, and, and lifted and the structure that supports this sort of wine glass object, and then the um, more simple um, steel frayed um, social hall building. Um, the view from the street and um, the kind of um, concrete bowl which tries to evoke memories of this wall, the entry into 
um, the first courtyard, um, the first layer of sort of transformation, then going up the stairs um, to the uh, main courtyard where the religious spaces um, are housed. And um, the space um, in the rear yards which um, connects all of the activities of the synagogue. This was the first thinking about the project and obviously in these drawings the memory of being in this space was very strong. And the idea of this space of community um, bigger than the traditional synagogues but operating in the same with this sort of focus on uh, a center and the idea of a community in prayer rather than a sort of performance of a service and the actual space. And one of the problems of um, the Hebraic tradition is that iconography is equated to idolatry. So it's very hard to have any decorative elements. The um, crenellation was actually uh, about a, an acoustic issue with the hard surfaces. But the other element of ornament is um, the shadow menorah which uh, the structure casts and which changes the space as um, the sunlight um, changes through the day. Here you see the sort of menorah that um, animates the space um, through, th through time. One of the um, things about the description of the tabernacle that I mentioned was the emphasis on connection and the idea of connection as being the, the sort of element of community. And here what I tried to do was make all the connections out of light. So everything's pulled apart and joined by light. And it's light that sort of holds everything together. This is the view <coughs> of the sanctuary at night. The chapel, which took some of the uh, stained glass from the building that we demolished and intensified it and uses it as a kind of memory of the history of the congregation. Um, a view across the court to the administrative building, um, the meditation center, which is adjoining a garden which connects to the offices. The social hall, which um, spills out onto this um, uh, court and this multi-purpose room. And again, the leaving the synagogue and going back to the city. I just wanted to end with um, my seven points about architecture, and I'm sure they pretty much um, knocked off from Ken, and I apologize if they've been um, misinterpreted. But the first has to do with the idea of um, lenses. Each building begins with the site and the particular desires to transform it. Buildings are earth made of matter and a continuation of the geological processes that produce their sites, part of natural evolution. A building marks and amplifies its unique spot on the globe. Like a lens, it brings to focus and magnifies its particular time and space and place. The second is to do with the invisible. The essential medium of architecture is space, air rather than substance, matter which <coughs> contains the emptiness. Architecture is the construction <coughs> of charged voids, frames of opportunity, fields of possibility. I'm interested in space more than meaning, in the architecture of movement and flux, of time and event, rather than object and monument. I'm interested in the emptiness that material constructs. I'm interested in the invisible. The generative ideas of modern architecture emerge from, build, from the consideration of buildings as systems related to machines or natural organisms or the phenomenon of the city. I'm interested in similarity and dissimilarity, in relations of relations, in theme and variation, or the order and accommodation. I search for the highest common denominator to establish the field of operation as a framework of unity and a panorama of resistance. I'm interested in the art of math that deals with the logic of quantity, shape, and arrangement. 
and the study of patterns providing unifying generalizations for fields and subfields, in the science of structure, which enables focus on the encompassing and comprehensive, the inclusive and universal. I'm interested in buildings as apparatus rather than object, as instrument rather than monument. I think of architecture as support for human events, more like a camera than a photograph, more like a telephone than a conversation. I'm interested in generosity and opportunity rather than program and stasis. I've always resisted the idea of programming as authoritarian and aim instead for the generic and the general. The purpose is to provide a clearing and opportunity for the unique and specific to be determined indeterminately through the process of occupation. In the search for the authentic over the image, the actual materials and systems of assembly, the processes of construction become the aesthetic. I want to make objects that expose their cause, buildings that are perceptual process. I like to think of construction as growth, not in an idealized form, but the actual performing of the work made precious. I think less about architecture as art and visual than architecture as cooking and haptic. I make buildings by the gathering and assembly of ingredients. The plan is the recipe. Time. Traditionally, architecture's tools encourage the description of the static or very slow. We were unable to talk to ourselves about how buildings live in the rhythm, river of time. We could not hold on to light and shadow or describe a building's life inhabited and used. Built projects teach the lessons of time, of their changing presence from day to night, how they empty and fill, and are frameworks for gatherings and celebrations, how they settle into their worlds. The reality of time's passage and the processes of occupancy and use are design materials. And the last is green. Amongst the host of new idols the green architecture movement has produced, we remain more interested in intelligent design, working with nature, using solar orientation, shading, daylighting, window layering, as well as energy, energy harvesting technologies for sun, wind, geothermal, and river cooling. We use wholesome materials and renewable resources and build lightly using the least possible material and effort to encompass the most possible volume and space. Simplicity and synthesis are our goals. Simplicity is the property of being clear and concise, the principle of economy and succinctness. Synthesis is the property of complex elements being organized into hierarchies and groupings, reducing elements without reducing functionality. Our entire practice revolves around ideas of economy and optimization. Thank you. If there are a few questions, uh, you should sort of, I know it's a lot, that's a lot, and uh, probably t take a, a while. I mean, you can of course save the questions till the end where we will have a question and answer session. But if there are some questions, we could take now. Can you speak up, please? But I guess, well, okay. I guess like what my question is, like you have a very sort of rigorous process where you go about uh, your design. Um, and I'm kind of wondering with your material uh, considerations, uh, the way you sort of dress these materials, so using the channel glass in your Lubuena, the way that you sort of um, use the, uh, the formwork of the concrete in, uh, in the temple, the Jewish temple, um, is there any sort of specific like intentions you have there? Uh, like for instance, I saw uh, in, in the, uh, the Cantor Museum, you follow the lines of the ceiling onto the floor. Is there any attention like that in like the proportions of the channel glass and like the, the shaping of the formwork for the temple? 
you know, each of those is a, a, a specific um, desire. For example, the Channel Glass, if you look at San Francisco, it's, it's the city that's built out of horizontal clapboard. And it's a very like pervasive sort of image that you have of the city when you see it. It's always, you know, there's a lot of elements to the city. It's a very ionic kind of city. It's quite, you know, feminine and, and, and delicate. But there's that sort of pattern that I wanted to deal with, but in a, a way that was specific to that project. In the museum, the idea of um, tracking those lines was to create, a, 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 to sort of make less out of things, you know, to, to make the neutrality more poignant. So the, the fact that they just become markers, measures, you know, dimensions um, of the space and, and try to minimize difference. And I, I think in the synagogue, I, I showed you quite clearly, like I love concrete, I, I, I have an obsession with it. And you know, it's a, it's a terrible material to love because it, it, it's uh, got its own will and life and it's a material that's very hard to control, but um, I still risk it and let it live through my buildings. And I'm always happy to be surprised by it, but sometimes, um, you know, it doesn't do what I want. Um, or what I wanted, and then I have to rethink it. But in the synagogue, I mean, I, I put color in it, which is not something that I would normally want to do because I don't really like the idea of um, like um, ornamenting surfaces, you know. But I wanted it to evoke. Firstly, I had a lot of resistance from my clients about concrete because they think it's ugly and cold, and and it's hard working with Jews. I, I'm a Jew, so I can say <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, so the only way I could kind of persuade them to use the concrete was to tell them that it was going to look like Jerusalem stone. And they believed me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the reason why I do love materials like concrete and the kind of materials I'm always looking to use are materials that um, don't have a surface, that are the same all the way through, so that through time, their quality actually gets amplified and improved. They can sort of show the quality of time and use, and they don't fall apart and sort of delaminate. And that's one of the things about the material. Um, thanks for a very interesting and evocative beginning. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, kind of like following from the way you represented the first project about the how you responded to zoning uh, the particular res uh, restriction on height um, that you know in the synagogue project because it seems to me that I, I can only imagine I you know this may be a projection that that um, the sh change in the in the zoning that you indicated where monumental religious buildings were not allowed to express themselves differently than secular housing, but which you said is the, the you know, predominant type in, in San Francisco, is, seems to be the product of, a, a, say, a cultural a set of cultural values. You know, in other words, one can imagine a group of left-wing planners sitting in an office somewhere in San Francisco thinking, we really need to secularize the city. Um, and so the question is, why not, or, or whether you think it's possible for architecture to, um, to encourage or evoke secular experience in the context of building a religious building rather than evoke religious feeling in, in contrast to the secular neighborhood? You know, I, I certainly think it is, especially in the tradition of Judaism, because many synagogues are very understated, you know, basically converted houses. My own opinion of the quality of cities is that they need these cultural markers to actually create variety and identity. I mean, the way I navigate the Richmond district, which is sort of row after row of 25 foot wide little quasi Victorian bungalow is by the landmarks of unique buildings that exist on corners. And I was more interested in doing something like that than um, just making, I, I think San Francisco is an incredibly boring city. If you get away from 
the, the, the center. You know, you can drive for miles and it just looks the same. It's, so I actually am more interested in finding the right way to introduce some kind of iconic moment into that fabric. That's the last one. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Frank Arden from Detroit. Um, graduated here in 82. I'm struck by the uh, 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 indebtedness to Le Corbusier's work, uh, in particular in the first townhouse you showed and its relationship maybe to the Maison Planet and to the, the, the loft housing and its relationship to the immobile villas and the unité de habitation. I'm wondering if you could uh, I'm sure we're going to see a little bit of that from everybody, but it'd uh, be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. You know, I was brought up, and Ken actually knows some of the history of my early schooling, but I, I studied in South Africa where there was actually an amazingly rigorous modern movement, which not many people know about, but if you look on the first page of the Herb Complex, there's a letter from the Corbusier to Martinson in volume um, one, and he, he writes to Martinson, who was uh, the sort of teacher of my teachers, and says how surprised he was at such a vibrant modern movement um, being you know, so alive in South Africa so early on. So my roots are totally from that work. The reason why I studied architecture was I lived in Greenside, and Martinson had built the, himself a house in Greenside, which was a, an amazing like frame with brick. I mean, it was just, and you know, the suburb that I lived in was like all little um, concrete tile, pitch roof houses. You know, they were nice houses with swimming pools and all that. But I remember riding my bike and finding myself in front of this house, maybe when I was seven or eight years old, and just not really knowing what it was. It was so like exceptional. So, I mean, that's sort of my, um, background, you know, and, and so I, I grew up, do, I knew more about Le Corbusier than, um, you know, anything else. I mean, when I came to America for a short time, I lifted, I went to Chicago and I lifted right, because I was in, very interested in landscape as well. But then, I, I mean, that didn't last very long, and now when I go to Chicago, I was there a few weeks ago, I look at me, and I'm just dazzled by me, you know, still today. I, I mean, it's just amazing to see his urban projects and how he built like five buildings nested, you know, behind Michigan Avenue, connected to existing fabric and the kinds of spaces that he made. And so, I mean, I'm very much still, you know, trying to rethink that again today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think we have to move on because of <laughs> obvious pressures. So it is a um, very great honor to introduce Bridget Shim of the uh, practice uh, Bridget Shim Howard Sutcliffe, Toronto, and uh, um, extremely distinguished architect and teacher, teaches in the University of Toronto for many years. Both Howard Sutcliffe and Bridget Shim are uh, uh, graduates from the best kept secret, I think, or one of the best kept secrets, which is uh, the School of Architecture in the University of Waterloo, which is much, much cheaper than any American school, and also probably better than any American school, uh, because it also uh, has a systematic pedagogical system of, of teaching students for a few years, and then they have to go and work in an office, and they come back again, and so on and so forth. So the split between uh, being uh, educated, as it were, academically, and learning on the job is much less in, the, uh, as I understand it, in the school in Waterloo than anywhere else. And I think this accounts for the extraordinary prowess of this firm. And with, with that, I'll leave it to Bridget. Thank you. Great. Cool. Thank you.
Thank you, Ken. Can everyone hear at the back? Good. Okay, first of all, um, for my partner Howard Sutcliffe and I, um, it's really an honor to be here uh, to celebrate um, in this special event. Um, I guess in case you haven't known, Kenneth Frampton is passionate about architecture and he's been sharing his enthusiasm, optimism, and infectious love of the discipline for a long time. So I think it's really only fitting that in honor of his birthday, we're here to share ideas, projects, and experiments. Um, and it's really an ongoing extension of what he has been doing and will continue to do. So thank you very much for um, including us. Um, I guess one of the um, things about um, our practice is that we have built a very small body of work. Um, we've been a practice for about 16 years. Um, with a studio right now, we're kind of close to the largest we've ever been, so about 10 architects, including Howard and I. And our projects straddle the line between public and private commissions. Most are built in Canada, and most are built within about a three-hour drive of Toronto, which is where we live, in, live and work. Um, so for us, knowing a place through its geomorphology, its climate, its cultural history, um, allows us to more accurately calibrate the provocation of intensity between the wild and unpredictable forces of nature and the controlled processes of contemporary fabrication. And somehow our work lies or is situated between these two conditions. Um, in a way, this image is our most recent project. And I guess I think of everything we do as a bit of an experiment. Um, and we're very fortunate to have a range of clients who kind of go along with it. <laughs> Um, and allow us to um, kind of experiment at both small and large scales. So in a way, um, for us, the, the, the kind of um, exploration of ideas through the medium of architecture is a kind of preoccupation. This was a very early house we did in a back alley in Toronto, um, a kind of light-filled interior court that is exploring the sense of really being an exterior court. And so for us, this question of light which is germane to this kind of conversation throughout the day is again a kind of preoccupation. Um, at the same time, we live in this enormous country, the second largest country in the world with a very tiny population. And so whether you live in the landscape or you live in a city, the kind of um, the image of landscape, the notion of landscape, the mythology of landscape is all around you. Um, this is a recent project in a Toronto ravine, a kind of covered outdoor space that slips and frames views of the landscape, a kind of interest in the kind of way that this indigenous forest of black locusts, walnuts, and native species are kind of framed through the kind of frame of modernity. And then also um, water, which is kind of not one of the things that was kind of brought up in the kind of number of points at the introduction, but has always been a fascination for us. And one of the things that, that Howard and I love about water is that it makes, in effect, um, as Stanley said, the kind of um, invisible visible. So these questions of steam and mist and ice are kind of um, made palpable through the kind of register of water. Uh, winter is a really long season. Um, and uh, so we think about it all the time. And we think about not just this verdant summer green, uh, which is easier to do in other climatic zones, but we actually think about how our buildings will be imagined in a snowstorm or kind of in this kind of winter condition. And we think about our buildings from the outside in. And then even though it's not quite the kind of fashionable thing in most architecture schools today, we think about them from the inside out. And so we're kind of preoccupied with this kind of push and pull between inside and out. And uh, um, it's sort of what is what uh, one of our kind of ongoing interests. As you know, we live in Canada, and in a way, um, the more majority of our own work is actually located at what, what I would describe as the bottom edge of the Canadian shield. So if this is the shield, and the shield is described as a kind of stone necklace around Hudson's Bay. So if you see Hudson's Bay here, this kind of ancient uh, metamorphic rock, the oldest rock in the world, um, and the kind of way that um, our work is kind of clustered at the bottom end of what is a very enormous geographic area. And the image on the right is a kind of view of the group of seven, a kind of group of Canadian artists. So the first people to start to depict the Canadian landscape, not as pristine and, and uh, lovely and pastoral, but somehow to show the kind of rawness of nature 
And in this uh, view, uh, you can see the kind of roughness of the water beyond, the kind of ominous clouds, and in effect, the, sh the trees being shaped literally by the west wind. And the kind of idea that as opposed to uh, pretending it's a different and more pastoral condition, there's a kind of acceptance of that rawness and a kind of inclusion into um, uh, the work itself. So we're always experimenting. And in a way, what I want to do is show three projects, but in each case, show a kind of preceding experiment that inform the thinking and the ideas of the, the other projects. So there's a kind of uh, symbiotic relationship between them. Um, and the first is Moreland's Camp. This is a project we did a while ago. It sits in an area called Halliburton, about two hours north of Toronto. It's on the shield. You can see the kind of building. It's a camp building for a dining hall, for a camp for inner city kids, a nonprofit group, very low budget, very seasonal. So part of the idea was to use off the shelf items. We used a greenhouse glazing that uh, was very inexpensive. We used natural cedar so they never had to paint anything. And then we created in effect a space for three meals a day, um, kids, counselors for this dining hall. And uh, here is the view from the dock where you're seeing the kind of separation of wall and roof. Again, this kind of articulation of all of these elements of architecture and the main space, which is where these kids have three meals a day. So there's a kind of main skylight that is the ridge going right down the center, a series of blue lamb frames and a kind of hybrid condition of steel and wood together. And we love these kind of hybrid uh, explorations. We drive our structural engineers crazy because they all have different rates of expansion and contraction. But in a way for us, there's a kind of expression of the kind of architecture using extremely simple means to do so. Down the center, a whole series of two by fours, and they in effect provide a kind of sense of a light monitor. So the light is actually above, they provide some shading, and then also a kind of measure of the time of the day. Sorry. Um, so in the project, um, we watched the, the, uh, the people running the camp close up this building and fasten pieces of plywood into the window frames at the end of every season. And so we actually devised a series of brisolets that actually provide the opportunity for parts of the building to shade the main dining hall at the hottest parts of the day, spaces that were at the scale of children, and then they can close their whole building up in a very short period of time. The kind of idea that the kind of extension of the building becomes a kind of outdoor porch, which is very much part of the vernacular condition, but it's rethought and reconsidered, and then uh, again kind of frames the landscape beyond. And then this kind of question of um, the way that the building actually takes on these very um, local conditions. So what you're looking at is this kind of um, ready-made greenhouse glazing, a kind of siding, a metal siding that's typically used on barns, a kind of cedar that is a kind of very local condition and yet um, assembles them together um, in a slightly different way. In a way for us at the same time, uh, sh uh, shortly after, um, we started to design a cabin uh, in Georgian Bay. And so many of the lessons that we learned from this project we were able to kind of absorb or kind of synthesize in a different way. Um, this is a painting by a Canadian artist named Patterson Ewan. Uh, he's often referred to as the router guy because he would often take pieces of plywood and these are actually removed from the plywood and then filled with an alkaline dye. And we actually designed a studio for Patterson before he died and he worked in it for several years and was a kind of inspiration in terms of the way that his work actually tried to describe phenomena, weather, climate, and have you understand the kind of power of these different conditions. So the project that was the kind of beneficiary of the experiment of the, um, the Moorlands Camp Dining Hall is this very small cabin. And we thought of it as a kind of wooden tent. So early sketches, a kind of rendering where, where the kind of main space really is intended to feel like a porch. So here you are in this kind of wild landscape, but wanting it to be open and accepting of it um, and maybe not so afraid of it. A very simple system, uh, thinking very carefully about foundations, a kind of adapted screw jack from scaffolding to provide a kind of light way of literally touching down into this ancient rock. Um, a kind of very uh, regularized system um, and a series of kind of models that are kind of the development of both the 
building idea, the kind of conceptual thinking, as well as the construction idea, because in many of our projects, they're interwoven and intertwined together. Um, this project is on an island, so everything had to be thought of as a kit of parts. So we kind of almost built it and then almost imagined how you would disassemble it, how you would actually think about how it's fabricated, and uh, thinking about, again, the lightness of every piece. So every element had to be carried by two people over a rocky terrain, transferred several times, and so the kind of, um, uh, the, its intrinsic ability to be maneuvered uh, through different water land conditions was actually part of the criteria. And then we actually built full-size mock-ups, and which is some of the, one of the things that we love doing. Um, we actually got our structural engineers to actually sign off on the mock-up as opposed to the structural drawing so that we could again kind of push this question of lightness even further. And then this looks like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, but this is how they got all of the SIPs uh, structurally insulated panels from the marina onto a barge, onto the island, then had to be carried to the actual site itself. And then here you're seeing the actual building where you're reading the porch and the sense of how it's actually both connected but also hovering above this ancient rock, which is the Canadian shield. The kind of framing of views of Georgian Bay, so a la the kind of group of seven landscape, this kind of big sky, ancient rock, kind of west wind trees um, being really part of the psyche of the place. And then the interior where the kind of earlier skylight developed in the Moorlands camp with a very low budget, with a kind of larger public use, is refined, it's elaborated, it's kind of rethought and actually used again in a quite a different way. So here you actually have a curving uh, wood ceiling and only possible, only possible in this landscape because it was all built in a shop through the winter, so under controlled environments, but designed in such a way to be disassembled and then be reassembled because this question of craft isn't always so easy everywhere you go. So in this area, to expect something like this from local craftsmen is kind of a problematic condition. And so we have to rethink, in effect, the local condition in relation to our desire for a kind of level of refinement and worked with local craftsmen as well as these brought in pieces and did a hybrid combined condition. And then framing views of the landscape, these slot narrow views of the forest. And then at the same time, these kind of the porch-like condition of looking out to the kind of uh, big water and the kind of larger big sky landscape. And then a series of very um, light uh, fiberglass panels that allow you to push and pull depending on the orientation of the wind and the angle of the sun, being able to modify and amplify the space itself. And then the next experiment is a kind of um, one where um, we uh, worked on a project um, now 1994, a little red house. It's the little red house that could be designed in Toronto, again in a back alley for an architect who was our client clad in red plywood. And um, about 10 years later, the same client came back to us and asked us if we would design a studio. And we actually now have about four projects that are these kind of pairs where we did something a while ago and then we do something again. And it's a kind of odd phenomena to actually have a slight conversation with yourself. So the idea of, so you're seeing a glimpse of the early Red House and then the newest piece that we did on the same property for the same client. And so this is a client who is an architect archivist. And so here is a kind of one room and we actually applied for a building permit for a garage and, uh, but he doesn't drive, and so hence you get the studio. Um, so part of it was a whole experiment in light. One of the things he wanted was he has a large, what he calls a working reference library, a large collection of architectural posters, um, and wanted both glowing light, but no direct light, which is a kind of common condition for galleries where you're viewing things. And so because this was a garage, we could build it on the property line, a very low budget and a series of little light coffers with a very thin skylight and the, the thickness of the wall actually changes on every elevation. So this is the south elevation and the thinnest wall and programmatically the wall is for viewing. This is a slightly thicker wall and behind all of those amazing architectural posters are a series of bookshelves 
for his working reference library. And then the slightly deeper wall has both deeper storage where all of those kind of invitations are located, a storage of either um, images or books, and then garden storage on the back side of the wall from the outside. And then a sense of the kind of uh, experience of this kind of light-filled room, but with no direct light itself. And in a way for us, that was a really interesting ability in a very low budget, small project to really be able to explore a kind of idea of light that we had for another project that we were working on. So again, this reciprocity between one thing at a small scale actually informing something at a larger scale. And it was wonderful in the beginning to hear um, Stanley talk about a synagogue because we were actually fortunate to be able to also design a synagogue. And I think went through many of the kind of early research where there's no building type, there's no requirements, there's very few things that you really have to do to design a synagogue. And it was uh, for a reform congregation in uh, Portland, Maine. And I think that one of the questions they had was um, about light itself. And we were able to observe a kind of sunrise and an early morning ceremony. And this question of light was a kind of preoccupation for us. So here's a very early sketch, thinking about the light as it would come in during sunset. And then a kind of early study model, actually exploring again this very question of light and the kind of idea about how someone who arrives for a Friday evening service but also shows up for the Saturday morning service in the same space actually understands the transformative aspect of the space and maybe it's only because of the light. Um, again, a kind of perspective study and this kind of interest again um, of splitting apart things and using the light as a kind of register um, and a kind of way that landscape and water are kind of preoccupations. Again, uh, framing and drawing you from uh, the everyday busy world into the kind of world of a sacred space. And this kind of idea of journey, I think, is very much part of our kind of interest a kind of early site model, but it gives you a sense of the kind of project overall. Uh, so you're looking at an existing 1920s Portland Public School, the main road, um, a kind of entry courtyard between the existing school and the new sanctuary social hall, the hallway that really brings you into a view of uh, the garden, a glimpse, um, and then the main sanctuary. And part of the kind of uh, dilemma of the program, as well as its opportunity, is to have a sanctuary for about 250 people for most of the year, but also a space for gathering of 700 people for high holidays. And I think that's a common problem with an issue related to religious programs. Uh, library, rabbis, offices, admin along this linear pathway, and a kind of uh, use of both a skylight as well as a clear story. And here you're seeing the kind of uh, project from a distance. Um, we're really close to the kind of Dunkin' Donuts, which is really part of the context and the kind of idea that the roof and the kind of landscaping in effect frames views of the sky and really obscures the kind of foreground to change your relationship to it. And then here's a kind of view of the entry court. So the existing Portland Public School is on, it's sort of to your right. The main entry doors are here and you're looking at the social hall which is part of this extended space. And uh, this is actually the first time we've ever shown this project. It was finished about a year ago, but we're waiting for the landscape to kind of um, develop. And so these photographs were shot um, really recently. And uh, it's the first time I've seen them big. Um, so um, here you are looking at the exterior cladding. And so you're actually seeing horizontal cypress that's being used and the idea is that it'll weather gray so they don't actually have to paint or maintain it. And then you're looking at the skylight but above it, uh, the clear story windows and then you're actually seeing there is a skylight um, uh, on top of that. So you're getting light in these baffles from, from both the side but also above and they become the way that depending on the time of the day that you're there, you register the light in front or behind of the baffle. Um, and again, here you're reading this kind of condition. And um, I mean, it was interesting to sort of hear um, and see the images of San Francisco because Portland, Maine is very much, it has a very brick core, uh, the working port, but much of the residential fabric is clabbered. 
as, as the kind of New England area is. And so this question of embracing the light, understanding the light, both a kind of exterior condition and then also an interior condition. So here's that hallway leading you from the entry toward the sanctuary itself. And then when you enter again, this question of light and the way that the combination of the clear story versus and the skylight together and these kind of tilted baffles actually provide a kind of register understanding of the light. And there are actually times that the congregation is there, especially during high holidays, for a whole day or a day and a half. And so this kind of reading of the space through the light is actually part of the kind of experience itself. So when it is a high holiday, the sanctuary and the social hall, which are often seen as two separate spaces, are able to become linked and read as totally one space. And one of the things the congregation asked us to do was to create a space that was both contained and open-ended. And so here you actually have the containment of these two walls, west and east. The west section is articulated differently than the east section to really capture the light at this latitude. And then one side looks into the courtyard, the entry court, which is very urban, and the other side looks into the sanctuary garden. And here you're looking at the uh, bima, the reading table, um, the ner tamid, and the, uh, the ark holding uh, the Torah. And a kind of view at night where you sort of get a sense of, again, this transformed condition and the role of artificial light really kind of um, uh, providing a different reading of the building in relation to natural light. So this kind of um, um, sort of thinking through of both day and night. And then a view in the evening where that kind of hallway, the walk from the hallway through is kind of also made legible. The kind of section of the west side being actually different than the section of the east side because of the latitude. And then the sanctuary's relationship to the reflecting pool and the garden that surrounds us. So again, we're using subtle section to really actually create a space that they actually now call the sanctuary garden. And so it's really a kind of idea that the garden and the sanctuary are not two separate spaces, but are really considered one space. And again, this kind of viewing of the light and this changing quality. And so the kind of idea that it almost becomes a calendar to understand the sun through the day. And they, then again, um, you know, neither Howard and I are Jewish, but um, we were invited to uh, design the kind of key elements uh, for the liturgy. And so here is the, the kind of Ark and the Torahs, but also the Ner Tamid. Um, so it is the kind of um, everlasting light, which has got a solar connecting to a solar panel on the roof and a series of kind of uh, uh, layers of uh, bronze mesh to kind of interpret that kind of symbolic aspect. And then the kind of last shared experiment is a kind of early house that we designed in the Thousand Islands, which is in Lake, uh, in the St. Lawrence River between um, upstate New York and uh, southern Ontario. And this is in a place called Howe Island, which is a fairly um, predominantly dairy farming island. And we love this kind of agricultural landscape, but it was actually being transformed by being bought up and turned into fairly suburban lots. And so the first thing we did after we designed the project was seeded the entire five acre property with a clover meadow. And it smells amazing in the springtime. Um, and it kind of creates a kind of agricultural condition in this sort of slightly changing suburban landscape. And the really important part of the project is this kind of um, section which steps down. And so when you enter the project, you're actually viewing it from an upper level which is obscured and we use fiberglass. And then you come down to actually be in a reflecting pool that's almost as big as the actual house itself. So here you're actually seeing this kind of obscuring of the landscape. And this was a kind of, this isn't a system. We just used two layers of um, this fiberglass with an airspace in between. It was a kind of summer project. And so we experimented with this kind of way of obscuring the landscape to then allow you to come down and to be in the landscape. And then even though you're on an island, you would think you would get to build really close to the water, but all the regulations prevent you from doing so. So you end up being having setbacks, and so the reflecting pool actually creates the idea of island and makes it a reality in the project. And so here you are in the kind of main living space where the kind of uh, big sliders open up and you're in this kind of 
a very uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, modern screened-in porch. And again, this question of water and its proximity to buildings and these other conditions that it creates where you're interlocking light landscape but water becomes a kind of predominant player within it, um, allowing you to read maybe these more ephemeral or slightly invisible things and be always cognizant of it. And the kind of idea of a water landscape being as powerful as the kind of ground landscape. And again, what happens here is that then a local farmer comes and cuts down the clover meadow and then two weeks later it rises up again. So again, even though it's not an agricultural property, the kind of idea of the agricultural cycle actually gets embedded into the architecture of the project. And the idea of it kind of reading as a lantern in the meadow. So this idea of this glowing condition and you don't see it all and, and the section unfolds before you. So in um, a few years ago, we were asked uh, to design a project uh, for a mathematician who is also a concert violinist. It sounds like a kind of first year studio that you might set in some architecture school. Uh, architect, uh, a mathematician, violinist, he likes curves, a sloping site, he wants a performance space for 150 people, and he also likes glass. So it kind of uh, was a bit implausible. And as you can tell from some of the glimpses of our earlier projects, we really weren't people that did a lot of curves. So it wasn't like a kind of thing where we said, oh, that was an easy thing and took us quite a while to digest and th synthesize and kind of um, really kind of redefine that for ourselves. So what I want to do is show you sort of process. And so early study models, and we worked a lot in physical three-dimensional models thinking about the site where it kind of reads as one scale from one end and then as a different scale at the other side. Large study models that we built, working with acousticians, developing specific aspects of the project. And then the idea of section, which is again um, something that hasn't really been discussed in the kind of numerous points that have been made, but is actually again part of what all of us do and is a kind of Maybe for us, the section is more important than the plan, or the plans look fairly simple and straightforward, but then how they're realized in section for us becomes part of the kind of um, the pleasure of working through the architecture. So here you see a project where the kind of two-story section from here and then down the hill, and it keeps going, and even though the drawing stops, the property and the ravine continue beyond. And again, the section where you come in at an upper level and descend down to, in effect, what is the main performance space for 150 of your closest friends, and then descending down again almost into the ravine. So the idea that the journey through the project should actually feel as if you've entered a ravine, whether or not you go outside is a kind of totally separate issue. And then I have a series of <coughs> plans that go from the lowest level up. So you're kind of reading, in effect, a kind of pool, a kind of relationship directly to grade, a kind of, uh, there's a study and gallery areas that skirt the edges and rooms that are more pushed into the side of the hill. And then as you go up, this is the main performance space with kind of this undulating edge, really almost being a contour line pushed out to the edge of the building. And then again, back of house spaces. And then the kind of main entry level where you enter and then descend down with these upper level spaces, almost reading as balconies during a performance. And this drawing is an early study, but again, if you think about the island house and the idea that you don't actually see the entire landscape at the beginning, but then as you descend down, it reveals itself and then continues to reveal itself as you move through the project. And so I think that was really the kind of idea from a very small project that we actually took and it elaborated. And so here you're seeing the 97 fins that we used at the kind of upper level. And in a way, this is only possible because of computer fabrication and moving back and forth between a kind of idea and very simple hand models to kind of being able to realize them in a kind of a fabrication format and to be able to do it in a way that's actually affordable and, uh, and doable. So this kind of use and interest in kind of exploiting the technology in a really positive way. And here are sort of some of the kind of different fins and they all were fitted, but each one use it going between the fabricator shop and the site 
and moving back and forth. And then here, everyone bidding on the fin package had to produce a fin. So in a way, it actually allowed us to do quality control while we were looking at tenders at the same time. And it was amazing the different approaches for the same thing. You would have thought it would be really similar, but they were actually more different than you would think. And then at the lower level, below that, there's a more standardized fin. So you're actually seeing, in effect, the kind of assembly of these elements, the structure. And one of the things that happens in much of North American construction is that there are these layers of construction. So it's like wearing different coats for different kind of sporting events and thinner layers and thicker layers. And we wanted you to be, it to, ha to you know, clearly operate within that realm, but for you to be unaware of that. So what happens is that you actually don't read a window frame. The frame actually gets slotted into this element. The fin is actually protruding into the room and there's an EPA cap on the exterior that actually provides the actual cladding on the outside of the building. So here you're seeing a kind of full-size mock-up where you're seeing the kind of shaped fin that is the more standardized fin, the EPA cap, and the way that the glass slips in so that all that assembly is there but just not expressed. And then uh, a kind of uh, series of templates that are really part of, again, this uh, time that we are in as architects where the ability to use the computer to do all kinds of things that would be quite expensive or difficult in another time. So this is actually a kind of metal template that was all laser cut and actually used to create this kind of curving condition on the site itself. So this kind of, and we're sort of fascinated and interested in these interim pieces that are not the final thing, but they're kind of essential to realizing the final thing in the way that you imagine it. And then the site itself. So the project itself is on this hillside. You can see the CN Tower. And this is a, a ravine called the Don Valley Ravine, a project called the Brickworks, which created much of the bricks, the physical fabric for Toronto, and a kind of series of winding paths through them. So this kind of very special ravine landscape within the city. And a view of it from the ravine in winter, where you're actually seeing, in effect, these shaped contours of the landscape and their kind of relationship to the kind of shaped interpretation that we had of both curves and contours of um, and light and landscape. The entrance to the house where um, there's a kind of two-story condition and on the more urban side we're using a shaped uh, etched glass so there's a kind of outer skin, a kind of airspace and then a double glazed sealed unit and then LED lights in between that create a kind of night condition as well and then the point of entry into the project. And then the kind of sense of panorama. Toronto's a very Victorian city, a lot of zoning requirements that prevent you from opening up on your side yards and really wanting a kind of feeling of being more panoramic and being in the landscape. And this sort of sense of arrival and entry and the kind of use of both um, clear stories and a kind of way of lightning and uh, creating a kind of journey or experience through the project. And a kind of uh, way that you kind of glimpse spaces. And here you're actually seeing, in effect, precisely the experiment of the island house, the density of the upper level, and then the openness of the lower level. So it's almost like a wooden curtain that opens up as you enter the ravine. And then heading down into it, where you're getting different views along the, the uh, contour line. And then the kind of architecture of the kind of railings and balustrades where they actually become a kind of other curving experience um, as a counterpoint to the space itself. And the kind of way that the kind of edges uh, at the second floor, the upper level, actually become balconies during the performance times. And the kind of overall view of both the upper level, uh, the main floor, and then the kind of landscape of the ravine tumbling down, the density of the upper fins in relation to the openness of the lower fins. And then a kind of winter view where you're really understanding the transformation of winter light, a very different condition and really important for us to think about. And the sort of descent <coughs> down the ravine, so outboard <coughs> stairs, almost as if you're traversing a hillside and a kind of understanding of the way that different materials come together 
the kind of glazing tucking in, the ipe caps here, the wooden fins on the inside, and the kind of uh, need to deal with weather sealing and all of these issues of our climatic zone, but maybe not to necessarily have to express them. And then descending further down, and the lowest level being a kind of pool that really extends itself out into the landscape um, and really reflecting, in this case, this kind of winter experience of this sloping hillside. Um, at the same time, our client asked us to work with a glass artist, Mimi Gelman, and we worked to create a blue glass stair. So here's a kind of a private stair, not part of the public sequence. And so you're in this, um, these they're blue glass shingles uh, that are laminated. They go from dark blue to light blue with a skylight over the whole thing. And it's quite narrow because it really, again, is not a public sort of part of the program, but very much a way just to get to um, an upper level. And then what happens is its impact is felt in other parts of the space. So you see glimpses of it and you understand it in different ways from different parts of the house. And here you're seeing the back side of it where you're reading the curved glass. There are a series of bronze glass clips and stainless steel cables that allow it to float and levitate. And then uh, music stands that were part of the kind of uh, design. And then a series of images just of different performances, contemporary dance, a kind of, this is the Simon Bolivar uh, orchestra, a portion of that orchestra, a kind of uh, chamber music group. And this is a group called the Aldenburg Connection, which uses voice and piano. And so in a way, the idea of this kind of oscillation between public and private is for us kind of an interest in the kind of way that the space has a very domestic program, but also a very kind of other public presence at the same time. So I just wanted to end and conclude with a series of photos that we took of um, uh, the seasons and this kind of idea of landscape for us is something that we experience every day. So I just started with the same view from spring through to summer, through to fall, and then finally winter. And just in closing, uh, I guess for both Howard and I, architecture fuses together both poetic ideas, inert materials, physical sight, and social conditions. And architecture trades on its ability to touch and shape people's lives in profound and meaningful ways. And its complexity, but maybe apparent simplicity, <laughs> is kind of what it's all about. And so thank you so much for letting us share a series of experiments engaging light and landscape. So we'll try briefly the same, uh, if there are some questions. Yes. Speaking in terms of maintenance, who is responsible for uh, fixing one of those louvers if that breaks? So there was a question about maintenance and fixing the louvers. They're all fixed, so they don't, none of them move. So you move in relation to them but they are actually fixed, both the upper level ones and the lower level ones. I got a quick question too. Um, I think it was Cedric Price wrote uh, Phenomenal Transparency. And so he's talking about the layering of different sort of densities, colors, so that you get different feelings, understandings of the space through this layering of materials. I'm definitely seeing that and then also uh, I, Kenneth Frampton wrote in uh, Towards Critical Regionalism that the most important point in the building is that membrane where the outside meets the inside. And so I'm seeing this very rich sort of layering of like this transparencies, but then I'm wondering how does that transition happen? Like so I'm seeing glass with snow behind it. So yeah, so in a way I think the sections that I showed, the cutaways, uh, both the large scale working drawing details and then the full size mock-up were precisely trying to show that where all those assemblies are there. We live in a climate where you have to build from minus 40 centigrade to plus 40 centigrade. That's the zone that we have to kind of uh, look after. And uh, so it's not, a, it's not a kind of joke. It's like you, as an architect, it's a kind of requirement that you address that. So what happens is that they're all double glazed C 
sealed units and you're and they're actually capped in the kind of in that detail you don't see or read the frame of those windows um, but they're actually embedded within the kind of assembly and so that's part of the kind of experiment for us of how to really address our climatic zone while actually having this kind of these varying and different experiences at the same time so it's both a challenge but also an opportunity at the same time Any more? I think everyone's quite hungry. Oh, there's one there. Okay. So the question was about budget. Um, everyone always has a budget, and budget is always an issue. Um, I think that one of the things that our client understood that was that curves were not as uh, simple as straight lines or straight volumes. And so he was really an amazing uh, client that actually really understood that. And really it was, I would say curves were actually part of the program brief. They were a, a not negotiable. He's a, he's a calculus professor. And so for him, this kind of fluid volume and curves were actually for him the spaces that he wanted to enjoy. And uh, so we worked really closely to kind of uh, realize that. Good. Okay, so I think we're going to break now. It's 1.15. You should come back here at 2.15. And I would just one last question. I, I just want to get your attention for a minute. Um, I know some of you may not be on our mailing list, and we're planning to package up some of the, the material that's been presented here and send it out. If you would like to receive material, please just hand me a card or something, or I can give you my email uh, to send me information. See you back this afternoon. <laughs>